This episode is brought to you by the Boneyard Huskies Club. The Boneyard Huskies Club empowers UConn student athletes while providing UConn fans with access to exclusive community, utility, and rewards. Purchase of collectibles featuring your favorite student athletes directly supports the athletes since they receive a majority of the revenue. For more information, go to BoneyardHuskiesClub.com. That's Huskies with a Y-Z at the end. All right, this this guy needs no introduction. He's been on the podcast before. We like to have some fun with him. It's Dom Amore of the Hartford Current. So, Dom, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Jared. Thanks for having me. Uh, good evening to you. I see you're all garbed up. So that's yeah. good. Yeah, you can't take it off since the, since they won it all. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> got to wear. You're like Dan Hurley. You're not changing your clothes for a while. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. I want to start with this one and get kind of some inside baseball of your job here with you. In the past, you've been covering this team as a beat writer. This tournament run, you're covering it as a columnist. How is it different covering it as a columnist, if it is? Well, no, it's much different. Um, you know, you, you well, first of all, you, you, you feel a little bit more pressure to really write to the occasion. You know, yeah. uh, you're not just reporting the results. You know, you 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 want to write a, a sweeping, dramatic, uh, you know, well written, well received piece of work to to yeah. match the occasion. So, uh, go this my first time doing something like this as a columnist, something I've always wanted to do. Uh, that that was you know I felt a little bit of pressure each night to to do that. Um, you know, you don't have you don't have the responsibilities of the uh, what's no longer day to day in the internet or social media age. You don't have the responsibilities of the minute to minute details yeah. of what goes on, like I did in 2014. Uh, Joe Aruda, who did a great job for us as a, a youngster and is learning the ropes, uh, handled all of that. You know, I was able to help him on occasion mm -hmm. and and you know, kind of guide him and also fill in. Uh, which is kind of help that I didn't have when I was a big <laughs> um, So that, so that, that's different about it. But um, the the main, de and of course, unfortunately, our deadlines are not what they used to be. So, uh, you know, you can't write for the next morning's paper, which, right, you know, which is not something I can control. But I wish we're different. Um, so uh, really, the the main difference is you you're just you're under pressure to write something special. Uh, again and again and again and whether I delivered that or not I guess is for other people to to judge well I'd, I'd say you did a great job at it so uh pressure you, you worked well under pressure there Dom mm -hmm. um as you're going through this tournament run with the team working on different columns th there are a number of storylines that come out through the tournament which one stood out the most to you or is the one you know that was the most interesting angle that that you took well, to me, uh, it was just Dan Hurley coming out on top. Um, you know, he's operated, you know, this is a guy that used to play college basketball at Seton Hall and the fans used to chant, your brother's better, right? I mean, they, yeah. He's had, he's had lived under the shadow of his famous father and his famous brother for a long time. Uh, then he comes to UConn and he's kind of under the shadow of Jim Calhoun and the, and the history and the tradition there. Uh, and of course, you know, he pours his heart and soul into this, wants, wants to be great yeah. and really beats himself up uh, if he feels like he falls short. So I thought his evolution as a coach, I think he, he grew up as a coach. He, he matured as a coach. I think he, uh, you know, he was in much more control of himself, which allowed him to be in much more control of his team. His team reflected his growth, his evolution. Uh, to me, that was the most interesting thing. So on, on the Dan Hurley note, he takes over this team, you know, what is it, year one that they go to the AAC tournament and they, they lose by 40 to Houston. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it, it, it's year one of that process. Did you think he would be able to get this team to this national championship in being a top team in the country? You know, at, at some point during his UConn tenure, and maybe, you know, as quickly as he was able to do it. Yeah. Well, of course, there's no way you can predict and no way you can expect a national championship. Yeah. I mean, would anybody have, have dreamed in 1975, after UCLA won seven in a row and 10 out of 12, that they would only win one over the next 50 years, right? Yeah. I mean, would anybody dream in 1987 that Indiana would not win again for another 30, 
five years and counting. It's hard to do. And a program could do everything right and not, not get there. So did I think that they would win uh, a national championship five years ago? I mean, I would have been crazy to, to predict that. But I did expect and would have predicted that they would knock on the door and keep knocking on it because I felt that he had the program going in the right direction, that he stopped the bleeding and turned it around. Even though that first season was a, a sub-500 season, I felt you, you could see things Progress. were different. Yeah. And then the next year, if not for the pandemic, they might have made a run that year. They were red hot when, when the sports got shut down yep. in March of 2020. Uh, and they, you know, la last year, the loss to New Mexico State was a setback, but they'd been moving steadily. And so I would have been surprised if they didn't make the Sweet 16 this year. And making the Final Four, I think, was a, a, a realistic goal. And they did that. You know, winning it all, well, a lot of things have to fall into place and a lot of things did. But I expected that he would have the program uh, moving in this direction. But as far as moving all the way to the end of the line in five years, that that's that's quite an achievement. You know, that's something that you haven't seen in a lot of other places. You maybe you've seen it in Kentucky, you know, yeah. when Patino took over, then Cal Perry took over. They've had different regimes. You know, perhaps you've seen it in Kansas or North Carolina, where they've had different regimes. We'll see what happens at Duke. But uh, you know, for him to take over and do what he's done in five years, it's a it's an historic achievement. It's something that no one can or should ever try to take away from him. When you look back at outside of the perspective of the storyline of Coach Hurley and his growth, and you look at this team having spent time around them throughout the tournament, throughout the season, what do you think it was that made this UConn team so special and, and put them in a position to, you know, yeah. to take home and all? Well, you know, I feel like the, the relationship between Dan Hurley and Andre Jackson Jr. was kind of at the core of it. Uh, they their relationship they were they were kind of like partners they were kind of joined at the hip mm -hmm. and uh, Andre became uh, really his first captain and he also named uh, Adama captain but that I felt like uh, you know Jackson was an extension of the coach on the floor in the locker room in ways that uh, other players have not uh, are rarely are mm -hmm. so I thought that was a that was a big part of it. And then I just thought that uh, the team was very well put together. They had all the right pieces in the right places. And, uh, and, they, and they really had, they had so many different ways that they could win games uh, that they won a lot of them. And so, I mean, I, I was more surprised when they lost six out of eight yeah. than anything else that they did. Did, did you still believe in this team at, at that time when they were in the midst of that January swoon that this team still could be a team that could make some noise in the tournament? Well, I did feel, and I wrote at the time, that for a team to go from being as good as they were to being as bad as they looked in a, in, in the space of a couple of weeks, it couldn't be real. It couldn't just be that something was exposed. That 14-0 and 0 UConn team had to still be in there. That ability had to still be in there. Just a matter of getting it back, getting back on track. You felt that, that that quality was still in there. It's a matter of finding it, and, and they did. I, I know you're good at, at putting things in a historic perspective and looking back at things. Where do you think this UConn team will go down You know, in the rankings of, of past champions and, and past you know, UConn teams yeah. that have been, been playing at a high level? Well, you know, it's hard to touch that those 99 and 04 teams for you know, the record that they had. The yeah. way they dominated the original Big East, right? I mean, those teams yep. were like sixteen and two in the yeah. Big East with Louisville and Pittsburgh and 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 Syracuse and all those teams in in the league, uh, and then of course they beat Duke and all those teams along along the way. Uh, so you know, in terms of sheer quality, and in terms of of beating that high level of competition, hard to touch those ninety nine and 04 teams. But I think this team obviously dominated the competition that it played, yeah. winning all these games by double digits, which is kind of a, a singular achievement. Um, and you know, again, you know, it's they're all different. It's hard to rank them. Absolutely. Um, yes, we look towards the the future of UConn basketball. 
How do you think this kind of takes the program to another level? Obviously, I have a great recruiting class coming in next year. And now, you know, some of the pressure is going to be on. You want a title this year, you know, expectation is only going to get higher here at UConn. Yeah, I mean, good enough is never good enough at UConn. And it won't be next year. You know, it won't be. I mean, don't. As soon as they lose a couple of games, you're going to hear uh, a lot of the same things you heard this year. Uh, and that's okay. I mean, that's what you want. You want a pro, you know, you don't, you know, Dan Hurley kind of alluded to it when they were 14 and 0, is when the pressure is when you stink. Yeah. You know, when you're good and people expect you to be good, that's that's the kind of pressure that you want. Um, but I do think that after the 24, you know, after Calhoun's championships, he did a great job of of uh, jump starting or or elevating the recruiting even higher and getting even more yeah. talent and even more firepower. Thirteen and fourteen, uh, he wasn't really able to capitalize on it, and you know, uh, up the ante recruiting wise. Now, some of mm-hmm. that was because they went into the American Conference. Some of that was because that twenty sixteen class that everybody was in love with just didn't pan out. People got hurt. People left. It just didn't work out. So he wasn't able to really keep the momentum going. Uh, I expect Dan Hurley uh, to keep that momentum going and, and really stack better and better recruiting classes on top of each other. And the other thing that's different today, which I think will work in UConn's advantage, they won this at the right time with the transfer portal. They're going to be able to attract Another Tristan Newton, another yeah. uh, Naheem Lean, another uh, Joey Calcaterra. They're going to be able to attract guys from other schools who now want to come here and try test themselves at UConn and try to play for a championship and be willing to take on a, maybe a backup point guard role or a backup center role or an off the bench role, a specialist role. You know, you can't recruit to those positions because. Nobody wants to come out of high school, go to college, and be a backup point guard to play off the bench. But in the transfer portal, where it's like free agency, you know, you could see a lot of really good players gravitate toward UConn now that they've won, which is another reason why some of these coaching changes are interesting and important. So I think UConn's going to really, UConn's got a great opportunity here to capitalize on this and keep that momentum going, particularly in the in the uh, portal to reload as opposed to rebuild and that's not not just a cliche i mean they really can reload yeah no uh and it seems like they already have some guys uh, already online to uh take some visits and go from there so we'll we'll see what the team looks like uh you know once the portal is all straightened out i'm going to take a quick break from the interview to tell you about my friends at martin rosal's meats this fourth generation connecticut family business produces kielbasa hot dogs sausages and deli meats using martin rosal's very own original recipes their products can be found in grocery stores delis restaurants and hot dog stands throughout the state and if you're looking for your fill right away check out their retail store in new britain for more information visit martinrosalsinc.com and go support a yukon fan-owned business and now back to the interview i want to Move away now from UConn basketball a little bit. I, I know you're a big baseball guy. Season's mm-hmm. just starting. Yeah, uh, Give me your thoughts just on, on the start of baseball. We've got the new rules in play. We've got these mm-hmm. games coming in at, at two hours and 45 minutes or, you know, just under three hours. Yeah. How, how have you been liking the season so far? Yeah, it's well, it's served the purpose that way. The games are, are closer. I mean, the games are faster. There's a little bit more action. Uh, I'm a little bit concerned about, the combination of the bigger bases and the limit of pickoff throws. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, now once a pitcher has reached his limit of pickoff throws, the guy can basically get as big a lead as he wants. Yeah. um, And it's still, and and steal a base, you know, easily. So they might've gone from, you know, famine to feast and made stolen bases too easy. Uh, You know, then they may have to tweak that. You know, I wish the ghost runner would go away or at least just use it after the 12th inning, let's say. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you don't want games going 18, 19 innings. I get that, but I, I don't like, I generally don't like that. Uh, as far as the shift goes, I haven't seen enough of enough games to know whether or not outlawing the shift has made a, a big difference in right. rewarding guys who put the ball in play. Uh, you know, I also don't like legislating the shift out of the existence. I'd rather see hitters coached a different way and adjust yeah organically that's the way baseball's always kind of 
govern itself, hit the guardrails and, and come back. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, uh, you know, you, you got to adapt to the times and baseball's trying to do that. And maybe these things will work out. Obviously, you know, Tampa Bay getting off to a 10 and 0 start is something that uh, not a lot of people saw coming, but they have a yeah. great, great pitching staff and great bullpen. And, you know, from the Yankees standpoint, I wouldn't take it for granted that uh, Aaron Judge has gotten off to a good start at four homers in the first nine games. I, I, you could easily have envisioned him coming off last year and that yeah. mega contract pressing and maybe yeah, getting an egg a bad start. But he's gotten off nice and easy and in a nice rhythm and, and groove, and I wouldn't take that for granted. So I see him going right on. And you know, he's, I think he had his 223rd home run the other day, and boy, you think, boy, if not for the injuries and the pandemic, he might be close to 300 already. Yeah. He's really had, had quite a, you know, he's got, it's going to be interesting to see what he does the next few years. And, and who knows, maybe he chases some of Barry Bonds records, at least the single season one, but uh, it's, it's, it's nice to see him, you know, Roger Maris, people talk about 61 and how rough he had it. His rough year was 62. Yeah. Um, he actually hit 33 home runs and some organization voted him the flop of the year that year. <laughs> so uh, the year after a year like Judge had can be very, very difficult. I think it's good to see him get started. Uh, Red Sox, I'm just not sure what they're what they're doing, yeah. or what they're trying to do. Uh, but I felt that way before, and they've come out on top. So I never write that organization <laughs> off. And you know, I know, I know, I'm in the minority on this, but I really don't care for the WBC. Uh, oh, I, I hate the I hate the fact that you know, the Mets lost Diaz and, and, and yeah. one of the most exciting things in baseball was him coming into that crazy trumpet. Trumpets. Yeah. And, and, you know, when the Astros lose it out to they, you know, I, I just think it's too soon for guys to be ramping up and playing, you know, playoff atmosphere. I mean, I mean, I get it. It's a playoff atmosphere in March and that's kind of cool, but to me, it's forgotten the next day. Yeah. And these guys have to ramp up so quickly and easily get hurt and, and, and lose, Sight of the big season. prize, which is the regular season. So, I, I think those are some of my random, random thoughts so far. I like it. I like it. We always like to do a little sports potpourri with you when we when we get a chance to have you on. Um, I'll I'll go to a completely different topic, and this is looking well ahead. I know you tweeted out today you were at UConn football yeah. practice. You're writing about the quarterback competition. Give us a little insight based on what you saw today at, at practice. And we got the spring game. Coming up yeah. in another week or so. Yeah, so. coming up the spring showcase. It's not actually a game, but okay, uh, showcase. Okay. You know, I I think um, you know, I, one thing that that kind of jumped out at me was how much better I thought Zion Turner was throwing the football. Mm -hmm. I thought he was delivering the ball with a lot of zip and a lot of authority and a lot of confidence and a lot of accuracy. Um, but I think UConn's got the situation it needs to have, and that they've got people fighting him for the job. He's going to have to win the job. Uh, which I think is a good thing. And you've got Roberson, who <clears throat> won the job last year, then got hurt. You know, he seems to be healthy again. And you've got Joe Fagnano from Maine, who knows the system and might have a little better arm and sling the ball a little bit better. Um, so I think that's what you want. When you have the, the kind of team where a coaching staff's trying to put a depth chart together and they're like, who, do we, who are we going to play? Who do we yeah. have? Who are we going to play? Or worse, you're thinking, boy, this guy's really struggling, but we don't really don't have anybody else to put in there. You know, we got to live with him. Yeah. That, and you don't have enough talent. And for UConn to be in that situation for much of last year and do what they did in Jim Moore's first year really was really impressive to me. But now they've got some choices. They've got some options. They've got some depth, in other words, to pick from at quarterback, at running back, uh, and probably in some other spots as well. And I think that's going to make that that could make them a much better team. And they're going to have to be because a lot of the teams they beat last year are going to be loaded for bear. Yeah, uh, they're not going to sneak up on Boston College or Liberty or, or teams or teams like that again. Yeah, but I think they have a chance to be very exciting, very entertaining, and maybe have an even have a better record and go to a, a higher profile ball bowl game. And I think there's a lot of hunger after what the men just did. I think they really see what it can be like. For them, if they if they're just a little bit better than last yeah. year, a lot of a lot of excitement in uh, on campus and a lot of excitement in the state. Because don't forget, Quinnipiac did what it did as well as UConn. Uh, yeah, it's kind, of a, kind of a cool time to be focused completely on on Connecticut sports. Uh, the way I, I am, I, I was I was just going to say, and you you led me right into how I wanted to wrap this up between 
you know, what we've seen out of UConn football this year, what, what men's basketball did, uh, you know, the women battled through a lot this year, but still had a, had a good season. I know subpar, you know, compared to what, what people expect from them. Yeah, they'll be back. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for for sure. No, I no concern whatsoever, but between all of the teams at, at, at UConn, what we're seeing with Quinnipiac, uh, you know, we've got an elevated field coming to the Travelers Championship mm-hmm. this year. H- how excited are you about the the state of sports right now in Connecticut? Because it seems like it's a really exciting time to, to be doing what you're doing. It is, absolutely. And it's nice to be able to kind of cherry pick the best stuff like I'm able to do. And yeah, you're right. The Travelers uh, is going to be lit with that field. Yeah. See, I'm 61, but I could be, I can be hip and, and <laughs> use, use all the, all the, all the hip terms, right? It can be lit. Um, so that's going to be great. And, you know, with Quinnipiac, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I would have loved to have been in Tampa to watch Quinnipiac. Yeah. It would have been a little bit too much with UConn, a little too much traveling. Right? I should have, if I had to do over again, I would have said, let me jump on a novella or down here at Tweed. <laughs> um, but that was, uh, that. I mean, they were very impressive and very exciting. And that's, that program is uh, is a fit. If you're a New Haven guy and you know what hockey and Hamden are, yeah, um, a little bit different. Uh, that was really an exciting thing, and um, you know, and I'm always excited for Yale football, which is very good and and, and plays great in, in the Ivy League. Has been an Ivy League power. They won it last year as well. So yeah, it's a great time to do that, and in, in a lot of ways, it kind of takes me back to when I was a young kid and. Uh, you know, the New Haven, you know, the, the local sports was the whole world in yeah. those days because there, you didn't have cable TV. You couldn't watch every game on, on, on TV. The only college game was Yale in those yeah. days. For, for, uh, so uh, it, it kind of takes you back to that when local sports uh, here in Connecticut really, you know, is, is really something that everyone's talking about. You know, you go right. in to the coffee shop or the diner or whatever, and everyone's talking about the Yankees and Red Sox or you're talking about the Giants or the Patriots or maybe the Mets. Uh, but now you go into these places and you're talking about UConn. And yeah. now where I live on the shoreline, you're talking about a lot of people talking about Quinnipiac ho- hockey in my, in my coffee shop today. And that's great to see. So, you know, as a, as a writer, particularly as a columnist, uh, you want to be writing about what everyone's talking about. For sure. And I've had the opportunity to do that this last week, and hopefully that continues. Absolutely. Well, Dom, as always, really appreciate you coming on and uh, we'll have to have you back on again and we'll we'll dive into another host of topics. So thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it. No, you got me. You got it, Jared. Thanks a lot for having me. Anytime.